I'm happy to introduce uh, Amy Stepanovich from Access Now. Psychotic, cruel, vicious. These are words that were used to describe Nicodemo Scarfo, who was the one-time boss of the Philadelphia crime family. And my talk today begins where Nicodemo's story ends, which is at the trial that led to the current life sentence he's serving in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Scarfo ended up with this life sentence because he went to trial, and key evidence of that trial was introduced from his computer, a computer that was able to be breached when FBI agents installed a key logger that enabled them to get his password and bypass his encryption. The Nicodemus key logger was installed manually, but it was the first look we would have into FBI hacking. By the early 2000s, the FBI was engaging in full-on hacking operations. We don't have a lot of information about these early days of FBI hacking. Most of what we do have are some random facts, like that eventually the FBI gained control of a more advanced key logger that was able to be installed remotely and that was used to monitor an animal rights group. Most of what we know comes because Wired, thanks to the great reporters at Wired, they did a Freedom of Information Act request, and they were able to get a bunch of documents about early FBI hacking activities. One of the key documents was a 2002 memo that talked about a computer and internet address protocol verifier, or CPAV. The memo accused agents of overusing the tool, and they said that it was unnecessarily raising difficult legal questions and a risk of suppression without any countervailing benefit. There is even less information about this time available through the courts. Even though that we knew that these tools, um, what the FBI now calls network investigative techniques, or NITs, were used in cases involving bomb threats, criminal fugitives, and child pornography. But for the most part, we have to assume that when judges were involved at all, that they just greenlit FBI requests to use hacking tools. But recently, just in 2013, the FBI finally hit its first roadblock. Judge Stephen Smith, a magistrate in Texas, denied an application for the FBI to use a NIT in a case involving bank fraud. Judge Smith said that the request didn't comply with the federal rules of criminal procedure, and did not satisfy the standards required by the Fourth Amendment. So I'm going to take a second, I'm going to dig into both of these objections that Judge Smith raised about FBI hacking, the procedural objections and the constitutional. Rule 41 is the federal rule of criminal procedure that talks about searches and seizures. It governs when, officer, when magistrates can issue warrants in certain jurisdictions for law enforcement to conduct these activities. And it has only a few exceptions to the rule that basically magistrates can only issue warrants for searches that are going to occur within their jurisdiction. Some of these exceptions are examples like a tracking warrant, which means that a search can start in one jurisdiction, and even if a criminal defendant leaves that jurisdiction, it doesn't have to stop and be reauthorized. It can continue on. So, for example, if they're tracking a car, they can track that car across jurisdictions and don't have to um, go back to a different magistrate. The problem is right here in the case name. The FBI had no idea where the computer it wanted to search was located. And this was a huge issue for Judge Smith. He basically said that he had no jurisdiction to enter this warrant because he didn't know if they were going to comply with the standards for Rule 41. The FBI put forward a lot of arguments. They really tried to convince Judge Smith that this was okay and that this could occur. But Judge Smith threw all of their arguments out the window and denied, flat denied, their application to hack into this computer. Now, you'd think that that would stop the FBI, but it didn't for long. And just in a few months, the acting assistant attorney general issued a memo calling for greater amendments to Rule 41 to change it and allow this type of activity to occur. That memo was sent to the Advisory Committee on Criminal Rules. It's this really obscure committee that not many people know about. And the committee looked at the memo and they were like, yes, we can do this. 
And they issued a lot of draft amendments, and those amendments did a lot of things. And amongst them, they said that a judge could now issue a warrant. There would be another exception to the limitation in order to search a computer if the judge did not know where that computer was located, so long as some sort of harm was felt in the judge's jurisdiction. Now, advocates felt that this was putting the cart before the horse, basically because there is no statutory authority, no substantive statutory authority for the FBI to engage in hacking operations. Congress has never considered this. They've never talked about it. They've never issued um, a statute saying that the FBI can do this which is really strange because Congress often talks about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA, the law which governs when law enforcement can get access to electronic communications. Within ECPA is the Wiretap Act. And the Wiretap Act requires for wiretaps um, what are called super warrants. These are warrants that have an increased standard from other types of surveillance. They require, for example, that the surveillance is limited to certain criminal activity, and they require proof that traditional investigative techniques have not been successful or are too dangerous to attempt. And this was put forward because wiretapping supposedly is more invasive than these traditional techniques. But I would argue that hacking is even more invasive than that. It gains access to both stored and live data, it can have unpredictable effects. It can, target, or it can impact people who are not targets, or it can damage property. It interferes with human rights, which we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. And it's also incredibly invasive for the people whose property might be seized during these operations. This means that it requires even more safeguards, we think, than what is necessary for wiretapping. But Congress hasn't done that. They haven't put those safeguards into place. So ECBA, a law that is already, by the way, wildly out of date for the purposes that it was intended to be used for, having been passed in 1986, is now being stretched. Its meaning is being stretched and prodded in order to allow it to approve activity that was not even dreamt about when it was passed. When the Federal, when the Federal Advisory Committee on Criminal Procedure considered these rules, my organization, Access Now, along with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, we all provided testimony to the committee. We flagged that there was no statutory authority for government hacking, that it was probably unconstitutional, and that the CFAA, a federal law that the activity was being tied to, was already far, far too broadly interpreted, way outside the measures for which it was passed. Unfortunately, much like the honey badger, the committee did not care. <laughs> it went ahead and approved the rules anyway. And just earlier this year, the Supreme Court also approved those rules. This means that they're now sitting in Congress. And unless Congress affirmatively acts to either delay or to prevent the rules from taking effect, they're going to do so in about six weeks. This turns the lawmaking process on its head. Typically, you imagine that Congress has to act for something to happen. This happens as long as they do nothing. Oops. Um, and so it's taken about three years, but it looks like the FBI is about to gain incredibly, incredibly broad authority by pushing through a procedural rule without ever, ever having to talk about the substance. So what about the constitutionality, the issues, the other issue that Judge, that Judge Smith flagged? Now, I'm going to assume, there's a lot of you, but I'm going to assume that most of you know that the Fourth Amendment is the part of the Constitution that talks about privacy. It is the right of the people, it says, to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, and that right shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and, and this part is really important, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This last part is known as the particularity requirement of the Fourth Amendment. Now, Judge Smith's opinion on the constitutional issues and on particularity is really important to dig into here. 
because for a really long time, he was the only judge that actually had issued an opinion on the constitutionality of government hacking. Smith said that the government's application contains little or no explanation of how the target will be found. He keyed his decision to the fact, as I explained earlier, that the FBI did not know where the computer was located. He asked questions about if the computer was going to be in a library, in an internet cafe, or in a home where a lot of people lived. And he said, there may well be sufficient answers to these questions, but the government's application does not supply them. It's also important to look at the government's tools when we talk about constitutionality. The year before the Smith case, the government tried to engage in hacking activity, and it had to reapply with a court three separate times because its tools kept acting in unpredictable and non-planned ways. Its final tool, the third tool it finally got to return, two IP addresses in that case, um, was also flagged by the court because it reportedly did not execute properly. That's their words. The year after the Smith case, the court actually engaged in what we call a drive-by hacking operation, meaning that it installed malware not only on criminal content, content like child pornography, that it's a crime just to view, but also on legitimate websites, meaning it was collecting information about totally innocent internet users. Now, the ACLU, I had said, also testified with us when we went in front of the federal committee. And they flagged some of the constitutional issues. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn to them and their words um, to explain to you some of these constitutional issues. First, they said, if the government configures a website or server to deliver malware to the computer of every person who visits it, it will likely end up searching the computers of people who it cannot particularly identify or describe, and as to whom it lacks probable cause. Issuing a search warrant authorizing the surreptitious delivery of malware into computers of an unknown number of targets raises serious legal and policy questions. Moreover, even if orders for bulk installation of malware are deemed to be proper, the vast majority of websites or servers that the government might commandeer to deliver malware to visitors' computers will be visited by both legitimate targets and non-targets alike. So what this activity actually looks like is what we call a general warrant. And in the time when the Constitution is drafted, general warrants were basically the most repugnant use of government authority. In fact, one of the lawyers who was around at that time, James Otis Jr., had this to say about it. I will to my dying day oppose, with all the powers and faculties God has given me, all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other, as this writ of assistance is. It appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power the most destructive of English liberty and the fundamental principles of law that was ever found in an English law book. So these things are really bad. And the government's activity is anything but particular. It, talks, it would touch upon large populations of users by allowing them to receive the malware by just visiting a website. So it looks like, at least for now, that the constitutionality argument is on pretty solid ground, that we're pretty much in a good place arguing that this activity is not constitutional. But at Access Now, we realize, and I'm guessing the rest of you realize also, that the internet is a global technology. And so when we were trying to figure out what was happening with government hacking, we knew that we had to look abroad as well, or our analysis was just going to be totally, totally inadequate. So we talked a little bit about the United States. You guys guess what countries I'm going to next? Australia, actually. Um, earlier this year, it was reported that Australia had engaged in an operation in order to track the IP addresses of every single user visiting a website called LoveZone, a child pornography website. It was unclear what authority they were using to do this, but Australia actually has one of the oldest laws allowing hacking on the books. It's authorized government hacking since 1999. In 2014, it actually expanded its hacking authority. It can now conduct bulk hacking operations. Now, the idea of bulk hacking terrifies me. I don't really know what it is, but it's basically this thing that happens, for example, if companies install malware in security updates. That would be a bulk hack. It impacts everyone. 
amongst other things, that love zone investigation actually resulted in evidence that Australia turned over to the FBI and was used in the United States to indict users. The Australian Prime Minister has talked about its hacking techniques and described them as very considerable. So now I'm going to go where you thought. Um, China and Russia were described by Newsweek last year as being the most sophisticated cyber warfare actors. APT1, a Chinese group that you probably all have heard about for a really long time, has been in the headlines recently because of the DNC hack. They've been operating since about 2006, or the earliest records that we have. Russia's biggest hacking incident was in 2007 when they hacked into the Estonian government's computers and prevented users from being able to access government facilities online. In 2014, when Russia hosted the Olympics, the US State Department actually warned that users should expect zero privacy in Russia. And that risk became reality because security experts actually demonstrated that the Russian government likely was totally owning devices within minutes of them being powered on. So many other countries. Germany has been engaged, the BND, their intelligence agency, in hacking since about 2011. And their, intel their police department has engaged in hacking since, two or intelligence since 2009, police since 2011. The United Kingdom officially acknowledged that it was hacking in 2015, when it released a code of conduct on what they called equipment interference, which is double speak for government hacking. That document was finalized in 2016, although there are reports that they've been hacking for much, much longer than that. In 2016, just this year, Italy was found to be installing hacking tools on mobile phones to bypass encryption. France has now passed a law that allows them to hack into devices. And the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, was found to have purchased a tool that allowed it to hack into a human rights activist simply because the government did not what let, like what that activist was saying. Which brings me to the idea that governments are not doing this on their own. They're actually contracting with people who are providing them the tools to do this. A 2015 data breach from Hacking Team, which is really kind of the biggest provider of these tools, or has been historically, revealed that they were selling tools to Italy, Korea, Turkey, Mexico, India, and Colombia, among others. One of their most major clients was actually Egypt, who is, has a terrible human rights ex record um, and has also been documented buying hacking tools from a lot of other companies. Moreover, there are international hacking operations. Uh, Operation Onimus, which was revealed in 2014, was an international coordinated effort by governments to track down criminal activity. And Warrior Pride is a hacking program that was revealed in the Snowden documents that's operated by the Five Eyes countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And hacking operations are expanding, and we're going to see them all over the world really soon. We've talked about the expansions to Rule 41, the United Kingdom is also probably right at this moment as I'm speaking, talking about their investigatory powers bill, which will formalize their ability to conduct both hacking and bulk hacking operations. And recently, Kazakhstan required users in the country to require what it calls national security certificates on their devices in order to facilitate access to private information. And while hacking team has clearly suffered a few setbacks, there are a lot of companies competing to be the preeminent provider of hacking tools to repressive countries. And so stepping back and looking at this global picture, we realized how woefully inadequate domestic frameworks are to address the real true invasions that government hacking can pose. And we realized that really what we need to do is look at international law and try to figure out international standards, safeguards, and norms with a basis in human rights that could protect users against government activity. So really, what are human rights? Human rights are not necessarily things you can say. They're things you innately possess by the virtue of being born. However, there are a lot of documents that try to set these out. They cannot provide you with human rights, but they can guarantee them, they can identify them, and they can let you know when governments can or cannot interfere with them.
The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been around since 1948. It's received really broad support from governments all over the world, and it's kind of the, the initial document we go to when we talk about human rights. The standards in the UDHR have been used in other documents like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the American Convention on Human Rights, and the European Declaration on Human Rights. But before we go further, why don't we take a step back? So I come from Washington, D.C. Is there anybody else from D.C. here? <laughs> Represent. <laughs> so it means I have to talk to a bunch of people who do not understand technology at all, all the time. And I have to try to explain these really complex topics. And I'm not a technologist. I'm a lawyer. I'm sorry. Um, I always feel the need to apologize when I say that. And so I talked to our tech team at Access Now, and what we came up with were these three broad categories that we could fit most hacking operations into. And that way, we don't have to go through every single tactic, technique, tool, all of the different little nitty-gritty details and the ways that governments can hack. Instead, we looked at what the governments were trying to accomplish, and we divided it into messaging control, causing damage, and surveillance. So messaging control is basically what happens when the governments change the messaging in text messages or emails, um, mess with the domain name system to go from one website and redirect you to another surreptitiously, or actually deface a website to change the content on that website. Causing damage, what the Talon Manual would call a cyber attack, is what happens when either external or internal damage is caused by a hacking operation. So think about, for example, if a gun was made to shoot at a target that it wasn't necessarily intended to shoot at. You know, that would never happen, clearly. Um, that would be in the causing damage category. Also in this category is if data in databases was changed and made to be unreliable in some way. And the final category is perhaps the best known, maybe where most hacking operations that we know about have taken place, and that's the commission of surveillance or intelligence gathering. This includes both directly gathering information as well as undermining encryption standards or protocols in order to facilitate the easy gathering of information. Now, because hacking is really, really invasive, all of these activities undermine human rights. And so a little bit of human rights terminology. When something messes with human rights, we say that it interferes with that right. And hacking interferes with a lot of rights, and I'm going to talk about three. The first is due process. Due process is really important because it basically provides the protections to make sure that other human rights are respected. And human due process was really messed with in a lot of ways by government hacking. First, we totally get rid of notice. Um, any idea that there is overt notice from hacking activity is taken away, in a, or surveillance activity is taken away in government hacking. Furthermore, hacking could damage property without any remedy, without any process, uh, meaning it can deprive you of your property rights. It can also damage the internet infrastructure that we all come to rely on. Um, the Snowden documents actually revealed that the NSA had caused damage. It had, when it was trying to monitor um, the internet in Syria, it inadvertently shut down the entire internet. Um, this is, can we get audio? You might crash the system. Yeah, so I'm just, it's a dangerous thing. When you hack a system, you don't actually know what's going to happen you might crash the system. You know, so I'm just looking at my iPad over here, an update to Twitter. Not, you know, not an app that was written by some teenager in her garage someplace, but you know, for some users, the app crashed on launch. Well, you figure Twitter tested their app, but for some people, it's going, it, it wasn't working. A few weeks ago, Apple issued updates for iPads. Guess what? If you had an iPad Pro, it might have bricked it completely and utterly and permanently disabled the device. Apple certainly tested their software. Update uh, 
zero, I believe it was, to iOS for iPhones. Some people could no longer make phone calls. Again, they tested, but it doesn't, testing doesn't always catch everything because every computer is different. Different operational characters, different apps, different usage patterns. When you hack something, you are taking a risk that you are going to damage the device. So clearly causing damage is actually a really, really huge problem here. And not necessarily the intentional damage, the damage that government set out to create in that category, but damage that is totally unintentional. And it happens as a result of the tool or technique being deployed in a way that's not foreseen. Privacy is another human right that hacking deals with and probably the one we're most aware of. Um, notably, when we talk about interfering with the right to privacy, what we're talking about is protected information. So that means either public infor or private information, but it can also mean public information if it's analyzed or put together in a way that reveals private details about you. So if somebody goes through my public Twitter feed and puts it into an or applies an algorithm to it that's able to determine secret details about who I am, probably things that I don't even know, um, that would be protected information. And that's what we're concerned about in the right to privacy. Finally, the, no, the last major human right interfered with by government hacking is the freedoms to expression, opinion, and association. Frank LaRue, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, explained that when a cyber attack can be attributed to the state, it clearly constitutes a violation of its obligation to respect the right of freedom of opinion and expression. So then what, what are the rules to government hacking? We looked through all of these international laws, the court cases and international courts, and related topics, things like eminent domain, and tried to see if we could pull out some rules for the road on government hacking to be applied internationally. So the first thing we realized is that there needs to be a presumptive prohibition on government hacking activity. And now before you scoff, that doesn't mean it can never happen. It means that in order for, hack for governments to justify hacking operations, they need to show that there are safeguards in place and that they're going to do it in respect, with respect for human rights. Now that's going to be specifically pretty difficult in some of these categories, and it might not be possible. Categories like messaging control and causing damage, where the risk of harm is especially great, Government hacking might not be able to occur. There might, we might just need to prohibit it outright. Looking at eminent domain, looking at government propaganda, and the rules that we've come to accept with those things that bolsters that conclusion. But when we looked at surveillance, we realized that it wasn't so clear cut, and that it might be possible for governments to hack in order to conduct surveillance in line with human rights. But in order for them to do that, it needs significant safeguards. The type of safeguards that no government, not the United States, not any place all over the world has ever put into place. These safeguards are set out in the international principles on the application of human rights to communication surveillance, which is a mouthful, and we just call them the principles. Um, because who wants to say that? So let's recap. We have talked about the fact that government hacking is taking place. We've talked about the fact that it's probably going to continue to take place, despite the fact that there's really a huge failure um, in communicating or in talking about what that activity should look like. We've talked about the need to apply human rights standards to government hacking and how to apply those standards, and that when you look at it, that we need to probably put in place a presumptive prohibition on government hacking. And then we've said that that prohibition might be able to be rebutted if there are really significant safeguards in place in order to protect users against the government. So I'm going to finish today and talk a little bit about what we think those safeguards look like. We've set out 10. First is that we need a law. That law needs to be clearly written, publicly available, and it needs to explain exactly when government officials will have the authority to seek authorization to engage in hacking. When they do that, when they file an application to engage in hacking, we think that they should have to specify what categories of information they're seeking. 
and that that hacking activity should never, ever, 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 ever be performed with discriminatory purpose or effect. After we've got that law in place, we need to talk about standards and make sure we're using the right ones. Officials should explain why it's necessary to use hacking, op hacking operations to get information and that they cannot access that information through other legal means. And that means that if there's app information that they can only get through hacking, but that other information they can get through other activities, they should engage in those other activities for that information and only use hacking for limited categories. An application for government hacking should identify what t devices are being targeted. It should provide a specific time period when the hacking will take place. And it should be designed to only return those specific necessary categories of information. And if any extra information is collected on accident, clearly, because they never collect extra information on purpose, it should be deleted. Um, and bulk hacking, we think, should be prohibited. Um, it essentially impacts the entire internet infrastructure um, and causes damage that can be felt globally. And so we feel like bulk hacking needs to be outright prohibited. Applications for government hacking should be properly reviewed and approved by an independent and competent judicial authority. Now, judges don't really understand necessarily what technology does. They don't often have smartphones, even. A lot of them still use old flip phones. So that means judges need to be supplied with experts that can provide them information on the possible ramifications of government hacking and the risk of unintended consequences. So at a minimum, they should have access to these technical experts. We'd prefer that this happen in an outright adversarial process, but that's just not how systems of surveillance tend to work. And importantly, government hacking should be different from other types of surveillance in a key way. And that's a lot of surveillance is allowed to happen in emergency situations. And we think because of the extreme risks of government hacking, there should always be prior approval of these operations. Now, transparency is the hardest part. And it's probably the part that people in favor of government hacking bristle the most at. Current, hacking practice, or current surveillance practice all over the world basically says that even when notice is required by law in different countries, that they can withhold it. And some of them do withhold it indefinitely. But it's the most important part because of the increased risk of harm. Um, we feel like applications eventually need to be filed publicly, although it's not necessarily, necessarily necessary for governments to disclose the exact tools that they're using. And that notice may be delayed so long as it's in conjunction with human rights protections. We also think that officials should, to the extent possible, and we note that it won't always be possible, but they should monitor how their tools are being deployed and keep a track of the status of the tool. And if it operates in ways that are unexpected, they should report that back to the judicial authority. Private entities should never, ever be compelled to assist governments to hack into their own products and services in ways that undermine user security. And that could be even in cases like the Apple example out of San Bernardino, but also cases where companies are under request, polite request by governments to implement certain technologies or standards that would make hacking more, more easy. And finally, if protected information is yielded outside the authorization, and the reason for that collection, of ex the reason for that collection should be studied, and judges should be provided with the justification and future measures that will be taken to prevent it from occurring again. Extraterritorial government hacking should not occur unless it's in line with principles of dual criminality, which is a legal lease term, meaning it's illegal in both jurisdictions, not just where it starts or not just where it ends. Um, and finally, and this is probably the most hotly debated issue that I'll bring up, because unpatched vulnerabilities create global risks, once discovered or received, they should be promptly disclosed to a developer. Delay should be possible. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Delay should be possible, but it should be in extraordinary circumstances. Um, routine public reports of when those delays happen need to be made, um, and they need to identify exactly what justification governments are using. 
Now, none of this, none of this is easy. Having this conversation has not been easy. Um, there are those that I know who would say that government hacking should never occur ever in the history of the world and in all of the future to come. And there are people who think that it should occur with no transparency, no safeguards, and no oversight at all. And I have been yelled at by both sides of that equation. And human rights, but ha human rights should not be sacrificed at the altar of government hacking. And human rights aren't the only equities at issue here. Hacking can harm property, can harm the internet, it can harm um, other rights as well. But if we don't hack, really dangerous people could continue to walk free, men like Nicodemo Scarfo or the people who are visiting Love Zone. So we really need to be having this conversation, and often difficult conversations tend to yield the best results. And because I believe hacking probably isn't going away anytime soon, it's going to be important for decades to come that we get this conversation right, and we get it right right now. So thank you very much, thanks to the organizers, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take some of them. There's one up top if you can scream. <laughs> So the question was the globalization of internet frameworks. Um, I believe you're talking about the IANA transition? Yeah. Um, we have been in favor of the IANA transition. We think it's a net positive. It's going to be a positive thing for human rights. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there about what's going to happen because of that. We've been trying to remedy that a little bit. We have a few blog posts up on our website. We recently signed on to a letter. Um, happy to point you to some resources if you're more interested in that topic. Um, there was one down here. Gray, gray looks like. So the question was about trying to make the government hacking for their damage caused during hacking operations. Um, we think that might be necessary, actually. Um, not necessarily all of the time, um, specifically when they intend to occur damage or when they do it negligently or when they do it accidentally and then use the same tool again and again. Um, you need to have that check to make sure that they're monitoring how their tool is working. Um, we actually, in a, so this is, comes from a paper that we just published called a, government response, or a Human Rights Response to Government Hacking. And initially we tried to think about if we could require the government to monitor how, how their tool was impacting non-targets and to try to provide notice to non-targets that they might have been impacted by hacking tools, that maybe their computer had been owned, um, and realize that that just wasn't possible. Um, but we think that there needs to be some sort of check to have the government staying um, answerable to people, that it, doesn't, it shouldn't be hacking at all. And there was another one over here. Sure. So the, the question specified the different changes to Rule 41, which I didn't go into. Um, there are a couple changes about notice that aren't relevant here, but basically they say it's an exception to the rule that says if the government wants to hack, um, it doesn't have to be in the jurisdiction where the computer is if A, they don't know where it is and there has been some effort to hide the location or if there has been harm within the definition of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, and computers are located in five or more jurisdictions. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so each one of them, we think, is overbroad. The first one actually specifically targets people for using VPNs. It means that the government can forum shop you if you use a VPN. Do, does anybody here use a VPN? That's, I expected that much. 
Um, that means that the government can go to any court in order to get a warrant to hack into your computer. Um, and forum shopping is a real threat. And it's not only just to determine the location, there has been a alternative proposal to limit this search to just getting location and then requiring them to go to the right court in the right jurisdiction to get the, the rest of the warrant to get other information. Um, that has been kicked out. That's not going to be in the amendment. Um, it also is going to allow global hacking, which is something that nobody is really clear what the standard should be. But it means that if computers are located outside the US, the government will be able to hack into them. The second change, the five or more jurisdictions, um, there are, again, a few problems. The first is that the CFAA, again, has been over interpreted way broadly, which means that there are a lot of things that are harm within the definition of the CFAA. The change is specifically, though, getting at botnets. And what it wants to do is allow the government to be able to search the computers of botnet victims, not the computer of the person, not trying to go up, but trying to get into their computers. Um, every technologist I've talked to, and I'm more than happy to hear from those in this room um, during the rest of the conference, has been really confused about why they need this authority, that there are other ways to take down botnets without doing this. Um, Susan Landau, Stephen Bellavin, who you saw on screen, and Matt Blaze have all questioned why this is necessary. Um, and so I tend to defer to them on their technical expertise, um, but they seem to think that this isn't a good change either. Um, there's... So I'm not going to give legal advice. <laughs> um, so the question was, what do you do when the knock on the door comes from the government asking very politely for you to turn on, over information? Sometimes it's alter your service in a way. Sometimes it's all different things. First of all is these non-legal requests, these like voluntarily, hey, do this. Um, aren't legally binding, so you can challenge those. You don't have to do it. Um, you, if it is legally, if it's a court request, you can challenge that. Um, we've seen people um, like Cal the Calix Institute challenge gag orders, challenge court orders. We've seen Yahoo challenge court orders in the FISA court. Um, we're seeing Microsoft challenge court orders for data now. We've seen, a everybody has seen Apple challenge the government trying to do this. Um, so you can stand up. It is difficult, we know. There are people who will help you do that. Um, and I encourage you to reach out to those people. Uh, there are a lot of lawyers. I am happy to give names of lawyers after this that will give legal advice. Um, but I don't feel like it might be prudent to do that in an audience of this size. <laughs> uh, right down front. Mm -hmm. Great. So the question is, where do you go if you're not in the US? So great question. Um, Access Now is actually international. We have offices in Brussels, Costa Rica, the Philippines, India, all over the world, um, and people who are happy to help you. There are organizations that we work with. Um, EDRI, the European Digital Rights, European Digital Rights um, is a group of a lot of organizations in Europe, as well as an organization itself that can provide help. Um, Electronic Frontiers Australia, it depends on your location. Um, there are groups all over the world working on these issues, um, and they're happy to provide you more information, both about what you can do um, in regard to what has already happened and how to object to things that are upcoming. Um, so for example, if any of you are from the UK, anyone? Yeah, you should be really, 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 really hard pressing to get rid of the Investigatory Powers Act or postpone it because it's a bad piece of legislation. Um, any women questions? Anyone? Yes.
Mm -hmm. Now this is, uh, so the question was what hope do marginalized people hope? What hope do marginalized people have to get justice in a system that's kind of set up against them? Is that? <coughs> um, we really feel like, first of all, there needs to be so much more oversight um, put in place on government surveillance activities and other activities that impact users. Um, there's a tremendous lack of oversight. Um, where oversight tends to occur, actually, is when we start to get information about things, and they like trying to figure out how we're getting information, um, which is backward. We think that actually, again, when we say that we think that these activities should be monitored and reported back to a judge, we think that there should be repercussions, um, both for the agency that allows this to happen, but also for the individual agents if it's a flat-out refusal to comply with these limitations. Um, it happens way too often. This is another reason we object to this VPN use. Um, activists, journalists, there are people, um, victims of domestic violence, there are people who need to protect where they are located, who should not have to reveal that and should not have to give up legal rights just because they don't want to reveal to the world their location and to anybody who can sniff their Wi-Fi where they're operating out of. Um, and that's exactly, the, the government is turning that on its head and using that as evidence of wrongdoing, and those people aren't doing anything wrong. Um, I can take one more question if there's one. So there are, the question was, how do you deal with companies who willingly collude with government? Um, there are documents that actually say that companies have the same obligations to respect human rights as the government has. Um, and we have been trying to figure out how to leverage those documents against companies. There's been a lot of shareholder advocacy pushing for companies to comply with human rights. There's an amazing project called Ranking Digital Rights run by Rebecca McKinnon out of, um, the New, America, out of New America that is actually trying to specifically go to companies and see how much they are complying with human rights standards and if this collusion is happening. Um, and that project has really been kicking off within the last couple years, but it's done amazing work so far in getting responses from companies um, on this, this issue. Um, so I think that's it for time. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you sitting here with me. Thank you.